When we're young, we have an amazing, positive outlook about how great life is going to be. But somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Can you believe that it is almost September? I can't. We're almost at the end of August now. Um, when I started this on the 30th of April, it was just my dream to get past the first three weeks, basically. And then it progressed and it progressed and it progressed. And now it is the most amazing experience I've ever had. And as I say all the time, and I'm not making these words up, I actually genuinely mean this. We ain't got a show without you listeners. So thank you so much for getting so involved. Thank you so much for requesting to be on the show as well. That's a great one as well. I love hearing your stories of how the show has impacted upon your life and the difference it's making. So let's really keep on pushing on until Christmas and make this the best 2014 that we've ever had in podcasting land wouldn't that be good and today is going to be a belter as well because we've got a guy who is he's mr personality and he has a story that is fascinating for so many reasons number one due to the hustle that he has shown which as we know is all everything and number two how it seemed that life was simply using him as a skittle and throwing obstacles after obstacles in his direction the kind of obstacles that for many would be the end of the dreams and desires for a better life when he hit the age of 27 he knew that he had to take action in his life he was fat broke and miserable and living a life that was far from what he wanted it to be so he started working twice as hard on a real estate business that would net him a nice amount of passive income each month not life-changing as such but still more than enough to start focusing on his next dream and that's where it all went wrong as after a year's hard work and almost touching the dream of the monthly income he received a message saying that he had defaulted on his mortgage and everything went south so what did he do to pull himself out of this hole that was not of his making and how did he not think see see that's why life is so rubbish and just give up and go back to being fat broke and unhappy well Let's find out, as it's with delight that I bring onto the show to start joining up the dots of his life, the successful podcaster, online marketer, hustle monster, and ex-fat guy, Mr. Johnny Andrews. How are you, Johnny? <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. I I literally feel great. That was, I just, if you could just do that again, I would probably feel twice as good. I could, I could record that for you so that you can have that as your morning wake-up call. Now, I, you know what I think needs to happen is we need to give that to my wife so she's reminded every morning of how awesome I am because sometimes she forgets. Don't they all, though, Johnny? Don't they all? They but, do. But it's probably because I'm not vision, uh, I haven't got the vision of you laying on the sofa in just your pants like she sees you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that is kind of awkward for everybody, I think. So now your listeners are, like, emotionally scarred because you had to shove that vision in their head. How do you feel about that now? You've hurt people. Well, I, I'm worried that a lot of people might be eating their cornflakes at the moment. It's a, it's a kind of breakfast show because you never know when somebody's going to listen to it. So You, you know, know, I had a guy admit that he listened to me when he was uh, showering. And I, I was funny because I wasn't really sure how to react to that except, hey, at least you're listening. But that's awesome. Soap yourself up, young man. Continue to soap. Who, who was that? Because I, has, <laughs> I spoke to a chap the other day who said that he listened to me. And this is like, the, this is like James Bond territory on his broadband or no his wi-fi shower head i didn't even know that you could get a wi-fi shower what? head that, that, yeah, why would you where's the what i don't even understand the concept behind what a wi-fi shower head like does the water come through the ethernet or something i don't know how it works and i don't know how he doesn't electrocute himself because there must be some kind of power running through it but he <laughs> he basically is in the shower soaping himself up and he told me several times that he's got a very good body while he's doing it and <laughs> he is thinking and listening of, to me at the same time i look delicious and i'm thinking of you I can imagine. You're, you're almost salivating. I can, I can hear the drops coming from your mouth from here. Absolutely. Yeah, it's like, and the whole, well, also, I mean, not to take it back to me, but the whole reference to a Skittle, I, I have no idea what that even means, but it sounds amazing. Do you not know what a Skittle is? Well, I mean, in, in, in my world where I come from, Skittles are found in a small red bag and taste of fruit and sugar. No, a Skittle in our world is the a kind, a sort of 10 pin, basically. It's your pin. Ah, gotcha. No, that totally makes sense. You know, it's funny. I should know that. I lived in Aberdeen, Scotland for like a year. So you'd think I'd pick up some of the loose vernacular. All I got was on the pull and minge, but that was it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's all I understand. Hopefully no one that lives in your world heard you because I know you don't say bad things on the show. But hopefully that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad as long as you're not listening in Aberdeen. And I've lost my demographic up there instantly, I think. Oh. I, yeah, think. I think I just yeah. I, I flushed the show, dude. I'm so sorry. Now on the pool, yes. Yeah. So what, what what do you say? What do you say in America then? I uh, think it's just hooking up, but I'm you know, the here's the problem with that question. I'm married now. I've been out of the scene so long. Like I wasn't even in the scene. Like, dude, if you want to know about stuff that really I was just never good at, it was dating. Until I met this guy named Dave Miz. Uh he actually was is he the a good guy. Kisser? Oh, he was amazing. Like, he just opened up my mind to a whole new world. Like, it, no, he's the dude that runs Insider Internet Dating, and I've since given it to my wife's brother, who has then gone and, like, met all of these amazing women. Like, it's really cool. Like, it's a great program. So if, if any of your listeners are, you know, unmarried, single men kind of people, like, Insider Internet Dating, I know that guy. And he gave me a couple of pointers when we were in Vegas, and I was like, dude, this stuff works. It's so cool. Because I I'd be the world's worst at data now. I've been with my wife since I was. It feels like since I was four. Basically, I was a young child when she first met me, and um, I can't remember dating at all. And I like the fact that if I go into a pub with my wife, I don't have to ask what she drinks for a start. I just sort of say, "Oh, go and get those seats." I go and get the drinks. And there's a certain amount of listening to people's stories and the kind of boring stories that you put up with when you're first dating. But after mm. a while, you've heard all those stories and they never come back into your life again and it's just you existing. And I like that. I like to exist. I like to be in this bubble with my wife. But to go back into the dating world and know that I'm going to have to sit there listening to these stories and also making more effort in my appearance than I generally do when I go out, it's a bit of a drag, I would have thought. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, man. I'm I'm like so much happier now that I'm married. It's just so much easier to just chill and be ha just be there with the person. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. So let, let's get on to the nuts and bolts of the show because you are here because you are, as I say, a hustle monster. You've had a story which is fascinating for many reasons and it works perfectly for a show like Join Up Dot. Now, what I want to do, I, I don't want to focus on the sort of miserable element of your life because it's so much nicer hearing the beautiful sort of birds singing and the squirrels making your tea in the morning and the kind of success level that you have got but it would be wrong not to delve back into it so let's go back into as you was a small child when you were small johnny andrews what did you want to be well that's what's interesting is because i up until honestly very recently i didn't i didn't define what that was you know, it's been literally the last couple of years where I had to think about, oh, there it, it makes sense to have a definition. I always kind of wanted to be, I guess you'd say, as a child, if you will, a musician, like a musician or a writer, uh, you know, in that regard kind of thing. But and, and what's funny is watching uh, as the as life has sort of unfolded and when I've taken direction, you know, taken sort of like steered my life the way that I wanted to go finally – uh, how relevant those two things as a kid became like I was a prof I ended up becoming a professional musician I played for 21 years uh, you know I toured Europe twice I uh, got to uh, my last show was House of Blues Chicago it's a great venue uh, really awesome awesome place to play and I was it was funny I was with an industrial goth metal band of all things at the time and it, just having a blast doing that kind of stuff what and then type also of music been, is that then uh, really loud and obnoxious, I think would probably be the best way. It, if you took like uh, dubstep and put more heavy metal guitars, it's pretty much like that. So it's tuneless noise. I'm in my 40s now, and if it's if it's not something that's come out of the 80s, it's almost tuneless noise. Oh, if you want an 80s reference, it'd probably be like Ministry, with, uh, but with a woman singing. That, oh, okay. That, that, yeah, it's funny. I was actually at Al Jor one of Al Jorgensen's birthday parties because uh, he lives in Chicago. So uh, that was a that was a fun time. But yeah, I was all gothed out at the time. <laughs> it, was just, it was hilarious. Yeah, totally fun. So, so what was it about the the music and the writing? Because you, you kind of touched on something there, which has become really evident in many of the shows. And normally, I bring it up in conversation sort of much later on. But I'm going to cut to the chase with you, sir. And it's fascinating that so many people say you need to find your passion in life. You need to find your passion. And I'm sure that my listeners who listen to this on a daily basis will go, "Oh, here he goes again. He's saying the same thing." But it's true. 
It's true, and it's my show, so I'm going to say it. And um, so many people go, find your passion, find your passion. And we found this theme that's running through all the shows that really is the things that you love doing as a child was your passion. You just forget about it, and you don't realize mm-hmm. that you could earn money for doing the things that you loved doing for free when you was a child. So you being a musician and a writer, it makes total sense that that you know really played a big part as you started finding your feet because that's your unique self simple as that yeah no i'm i totally have to agree with that and and it's funny because you bring that up it's i, I might have, i think i heard that before and i never really thought about it you totally you totally nailed it now the stuff that i did as a kid was the stuff that i always kind of wanted to do and i would always write and in fact it was funny I, when i was you know we were talking before the show i actually lived in aberdeen scotland for a short time and it's like when I was there, no, I you actually ended up... said that in the show because you used oh, I that... said that in the show. You See, used now there's those my bad words that only the English oh, would that's know. Right, that's right. Those horrible, just loathsome phrasing that just is awful. But yeah, that was uh, when I was there. I ended up getting uh, the, the classes I took translated over as 400 level when I finally got back to the states. And what was interesting is I was like, oh, I just have all these, you know, English courses in writing and literature. I'll just do that as my major. And I'd been writing since I was like a little kid, you know, tons of stories and stuff like that. And it was just, you know, it was fun. It was cool. And uh, yeah, I never really thought about doing it uh, as a, you know, to make a living uh, for a while. And then, you know, obviously Kindle and the Internet kind of came out and I was like, ah, look at that. Came around again. It is fascinating, though, isn't it, that we forget that we are good at something and we go into a job that is just paying the money or somebody says that's a career and you go, yes, I'm going to train to become a doctor. Do you really like being a doctor? No, but it's good money. And we it, it seems madness that we all do that. And it's not just in America. It's not just in the United Kingdom. I'm having conversations across the globe. And we're all doing exactly the same thing. We're all making exactly the same mistakes. We're going into mm-hmm. stuff that isn't us just because either somebody's told us to do it or we kind of believe that it has some kind of kudos and people are going to respect us more for doing this job. But I now say to the world and I say to everyone, we would respect you more by doing the thing that makes you happiest. Yeah, totally. I mean, it, and it does help if you can get paid with it too. <laughs> that is a helpful thing. Because there's not a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of people I'm sure that are, you know, passionate about squirrel shaving, but I don't know. There's a lot of money in it. (laughs) Just saying. We're not getting back to Aberdeen again now, are we? Oh, no. Yeah, that's what they were doing under the bridges. Yeah, absolutely. Those poor squirrels. So so why did did you end up so fat, miserable, broke and all those kind of nasty things at the age of 27? What was the sort of lead up? Because by the age of 27, most people, I would have thought, are starting to have an inkling of where their life is going to go. I am probably wired completely the opposite of most people at that point because, I mean, it was everything that I did was, you know, of my own choosing. I would, you know, spent the majority of my life uh, feeling sort of dejected and depressed. Interestingly enough, I'm adopted and it turns out I never looked into this, but that is actually a common thread uh, throughout the lives of adopted kids was that, you know, they have this sort of like uh, separation thing from like the whole birth concept or whatever it is. I haven't really looked much past it, but I was like, oh, okay, evidently this is a normal thing. And also the big problem I was having in my life was I wasn't doing the stuff that I should be doing. It was just like what you were talking about. You know, I was doing everything else. Like I, you know, the college I went to, I didn't like it. Uh, you know, didn't, wasn't really happy with a lot of my friends. Like I was just making weird, basically dumb choices because I didn't really understand the concept that you could steer your life at least sort of. I mean, there's all you're always going to get thrown like a curveball here and there, but like uh, ultimately, you kind of make the choices that influence who you become. And it was, and 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 a lot of those habits you develop as a kid, if they're not guided correctly, like my parents were academic. I come from a family of six PhDs, and so you know we had just everybody's a freaking doctor except me. You know, I'm like the the weird kid kind of thing, and that's really you know, where a lot of like, it was a very confusing upbringing for everybody because they're like, wow, this dude is weird, totally different, absolutely does not fit the academic mold. And so no one really knew what to do with me. And uh, so there wasn't a lot of guidance or training, wonderful family, wonderful childhood, all of the very cool stuff. But I have a different wiring mentally than the family that I was adopted into. And it was interesting to see how that kind of like led to 
uh, needing to sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I really, I look at it like, okay, we, there was a Windows machine that someone tried to install like a Mac operating system on it, and um, that, you know, you just have to like f disk it and re, you know redo the whole thing, and that was kind of what happened. And so I got to 27 years old, and I was like, <clears throat> wow, I'm fat, broken, miserable. I should probably make some different life choices, and I started doing that. You know, I. You know, went and listed Tony Robbins. I had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, but when I was doing the real estate thing, I actually, you know, I was with a girl that was awesome. We were living in a great house. It was super cool. But I was just like, this is not where I need to be. I ended up being homeless for an entire year. And so I was really? living. You were not, not anywhere. You're not even living with somebody. No, I was not living with anybody. I was, I was sleeping in a wicker chair, like this little wicker papa son in this tiny office. It's probably about the size of your desk. And uh, that's where I was trying to do the real estate stuff. You know, I was trying to make uh, make that stuff happen then. And what what ended up happening was, and so I I made that commitment. I think that's a big one. Was I didn't go back and, and you know I didn't go crawling back and say oh, I made this mistake. I, I feel horrible. Like I couldn't sleep. Like when I first did it, I was sleeping on like you know it's like concrete floor with that thin little carpet on the thing. And so like I was getting no sleep. I was like cracked out of my mind. Like it was I, – dude, if you go weeks with like just a little sporadic naps here and there, like you become like a very strange person. Like it's just – you're not fit for society. Um, but it was after – like literally toward the end of that thing that I got nailed uh, with the identity theft. Like it turned out like it was – so I wasn't late on my mortgage. I didn't own a house. I was living in an office. Uh, it was a guy named Rodrigo Lopez who had stolen my – identity and used it to close on his home. And so I was overextended with all of my money trying to close a series of deals and literally got this call like you don't qualify anymore. And what was interesting is uh, I uh, this real estate stuff was not for me or maybe it was and I just was doing it all wrong, which is extremely possible. But regardless, like I was under so much stress. Like I could, the blood pressure was just like, it felt like an angry animal was trying to claw its way out of my face. I was like drinking myself to sleep every night. Like it was just horrible. Then all of a sudden, literally the thing that I had been running from for years, like total financial destruction, just literally came and landed on my face like a wet cat, you know, just hit me. And that night when I just realized and kind of like had to accept the fact that it was over, that this real estate thing was done, that my money was gone, that I had nowhere to go basically, uh, I got the best sleep of my life. That's it was actually the best thing that ever happened. That is fascinating. And you are preempting many of my questions, sir. But on <laughs> the Join Up Dots timeline, time and time and time and time again, we find that the darkest points in people's lives are actually, with hindsight, the best points, where they look back on it and go, I'd never want to go through that again, but that was the moment that things started turning around for me. And you feel exactly the same way. I Well, it was a fundamental shift that happened there, and I can't really <clears throat> put my finger... On exactly because okay, you know when they say when the student is ready, the master will appear, mm. kind of thing. Well, the, that night a man came. No, I'm just kidding. No, what happened was, I suddenly like there was something that shifted. Like I thought I knew everything, and I was young, I was dumb. I'm now older, I'm still pretty dumb. But it's like I learned a very valuable lesson there that the, there there are things that are out of my control, and that I don't have all the answers, you know. And and that was a very fundamental key piece of piece of the foundation that began to be built in those moments and it was really at the things that happened afterwards so most of what i was doing and all of my mistakes previous to to that moment were all driven by lunatic hubris like i wanted to think that i was like the dude who knew everything and now i know i'm like i'm not i'm just you know just, all right, it's cool, you know. I'm fine with that now, but it took years to get there. But it was the failing and the being crushed and having to like rebuild everything literally from a zygote level. I learned how to learn or I learned at least how to be quiet and learn from the stillness around me kind of thing. I can't imagine, Johnny, that you're ever still or quiet. Very infrequently, but it happens. And so what do you do in these quiet moments? Is it meditation or do you have a plan and you go off into a room and you just work on the plan? Well, what do you do when it's quiet? When I, you know what? I typically just sort of walk around. 
I think that's uh, that's one of those things where I've found that movement is very important uh, to me. And so I'll put on headphones, listen to shows. You know, I'll do, uh, you know, basically whatever it is where it's like, I don't, what I found is, you know, back when I was in my 20s, you know, and you were talking about like the hustle kind of thing, like I was all about the hustle. Like that's all I had. Like I didn't know anything. I didn't have any assets or resources, but I had plenty of hustle. And so now that I'm a little bit older and wiser and, you know, I've had my butt handed to me on a platter numerous times, I kind of take time away from the hustle to sort of be like, I am, you know, I'm going to, because simply the act of moving and getting outside of your own thought process can be so valuable. Like you just have to take a minute and just shut up. Is that a, a, a fundamental point that people um, fail to recognize in, in their lives when people are trying to transition and they're trying to deal with the nine to five jobs and then they're coming home and they're working on side projects and all that kind of stuff is the momentum that they're trying to build up better served by occasionally not doing anything and just reflecting and thinking do you reckon you know that's a tough question for me to answer because I was a very different person. I'd like you know five six years ago I would have given you a totally different answer. Now you know I'm 37. I'm married, kid, another one on the way, kind of thing. And it's like I have to create a life because I want to be a good husband and father. So it's like I can't be that 24/7 365 dude like I was. Like that that's the guy, like the 24/7 365 super hustle dude was the guy who built his first million. You know, and I look back on that and I'm like I don't know if I could be the guy I am now if I didn't do that first. And so there I think that happens with a lot of people especially when you're younger and stuff like that. But now I look back, you know, I'm I'm able to learn faster. And I think the biggest thing is to be able to say no to opportunities because before, you know, and I look at people who are in the industry, who have been in the industry, even for the same length of time, people, it's literally, I think almost like a generational thing. Like I worked with a business partner, uh, even, you know, the past couple of years, awesome dude, amazing at what he did. His entire business was based around like flying around, just doing crazy stuff with everybody in every market possible. And, you know, when we did stuff together, that didn't work as well. Because it's like I wanted to just knuckle down and become like Captain Ninja McAwesome in one vertical, you know. And so it was like a very strong dichotomy kind of thing there. And it was – I think it really came down to the fact that I was almost 10 years older than him. So it was like that's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I think it's just – when you you know when you get up when you get up there and you you have those life changing things like kids and a wife and all those and all that stuff, it you can't hustle as much. So it's like you might need to learn how to leverage other things to do the hustle for you. Yeah, I've never made a million, and I, it sounds like you you've done it. How many times have you made? When you say your first million, how many millions have you made? Uh, I don't know, three or four at this point, like. Okay. You know, I, I mean, but here's the thing, dude. It's like, yay, millions. Um, <laughs> it's not like suddenly your life is like totally different. Like, I, I'll tell you something. If you can get yourself to like 30000 a month consistently, that's life changing. Like right there, you can have the most amazing existence of your life. When you're doing six figures a month, there's – I mean, I, I promise you this. Even if you have like – if you spend money on the most ridiculous stuff, it's still kind of hard to blow through. And also your business at that point to sustain an infrastructure that produces that level is is expensive. You know, so a million dollars is not something, you know, people look at that like, oh, if I could just get there. Yeah, okay. It's really more about the journey. It's about becoming the person who can handle it. Because the first time I made that money, I couldn't handle it. You know, I spent it on really dumb stuff because I went from being, you know, broke. Because after that whole identity theft thing, I couldn't get a job. I had overdrawn my bank account, so they wouldn't let me have a bank account. I couldn't get credit cards. Like, if I wanted to eat, I had to sell some stuff through the Warrior form so I could get money on the PayPal card to go down to the store and swipe it kind of thing. And, uh, you know, then I started selling through ClickBank and I was cashing these checks at the local currency exchange, you know? So I was like, you know, I, I did my first million in that kind of weird environment. Like I was paying my taxes, uh, with these little currency exchange payment vouchers. Like I, it, it was the weirdest thing ever, you know? And I, but, but I don't know. So it's like, you must have thought 
success you must have done to get to go from where you are to you know not being able to eat and living on a wicker chair and all that to suddenly going I've cleared a million pound you must at that point thought success I I felt I definitely felt better like let me put it this way because that was hustle time you know when that first started that was absolute hustle time and it was it, I, there is a uh, I think it was Rich Sheffrin said cash flow is like heroin and I was very very hooked on that like it was a metamorphosis from an internal perspective because I went from thinking you know I was a total moron you know because growing up in a family of super academics you know I never had any kind of like couldn't relate to anybody and like literally grew up with people telling me I was stupid all the time I was like oh I guess I must be dumb uh to suddenly it's like so it was it's interesting because it was like I was suddenly validated with cash flow kind of thing like that that's a very like what's the difference between you know someone who's eccentric versus a lunatic and the answer is money you know and that's what it is it's like suddenly I'd, I'd hit that threshold and passed it and it was amazing to see because it's like on the outward appearance you know I was living literally in like this tiny little upstairs bedroom I was you know 750 bucks a month renting it you know it was nothing I was working on this tiny little laptop still doing this stuff but all of a sudden now I literally went into this bedroom and three years later came out and was like I felt like a rock star and so yeah that there was there was definitely a metamorphosis but it it's 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 unsustainable if all you're doing is riding that hubris like it doesn't work for the long term is it, is it better to have that kind of success money wise when you're older do you think if it had come to you now and you've got a child on the way, congratulations, and you've got another child and you've got a wife. Do you think that it would be a t totally different ball game to when you're sort of 27 and it's woohoo time? Um, yeah, I think it definitely would, especially with the factor of the wife. I mean, there's no way that I'm going to go and buy my friend like a, you know, a luxury kitchen. Like I did that. I literally dropped like I think it was fifty five thousand dollars on a uh, on my friend's kitchen because it was the girl that I'd been dating when I left to uh, you know, go live in the office kind of thing. And we are still friends to this day. Wonderful woman. And I was like, thank you so much for all of your support. Like she's literally been like the most staunch supporter, even through all of that, of like everything I've done. Like when all of my friends were like, you are an idiot. What are you doing with your life? She was always like, I see where you're going with this. I get it. You know, you're working hard. Just keep going, keep going. Even when like, you know, you know, we were in love and doing all sorts of cool stuff. Like it was, you know, she was devastated when I left because I'm like, I have to do this. And even then she was still supportive. I'm like, the only thing I can give you is like, because she loves to cook. That was her thing. And so I literally went back and I'm like, thank you so much. It means like the world to me, everything that you did. I just, there's some token gesture that I can do and literally just completely overhauled her kitchen. Like the fanciest stuff you could possibly imagine. It just, it's, it's like amazing and gorgeous, but that was like all I could do. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that now being married clearly. Cause there'd be the, you know, just having a wife would be a little awkward. Um, but yeah, I think life circumstances definitely dictate what you're going to do. But the, the one big caveat to this is I didn't make money quickly. Like I didn't get rich quick. Uh, I got rich over the course of like, I wouldn't even say I got rich. I got, I made money over, it was like a three year epically intensive period, you know, where it just like crawled up that ladder. And then finally, you know, just, it started like really happening. But I know so many people, Johnny, and I've been in the same situation. You are saying that you're using ClickBank. And for the listeners out there that aren't aware of ClickBank, this is where people make products and they sell it for you to actually sell it to people you know on your websites and through affiliate links. And then you get a bit of a commission from it. And I know yeah, exactly. so, so many people who have tried that and haven't made a bean on it. Not 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 a penny, and it just hasn't worked for them. So, what was the angle that you was coming from that was so uber successful? Uh, well, the first of all, I failed a lot. I tried internet marketing many, 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 many times before I finally figured it out. Um, the big difference was, first of all, I went out and bought products by people that had a good reputation that I knew I would be getting awesome stuff. And today, like literally, like this day and age, the thing to do is content marketing. And that is basically where you're writing articles or producing podcasts or doing some kind of like, you know, edu edutainment, let's call it. 
where there's so much stuff out there. Like it's info overload is the is the one big killer. Like there is no shortage of exactly what you need to do to go make money with ClickBank. Here's the here's the, the reason why it's not working for people. It's not a thing that just works. You have to make it work. You have to get out there and you know, someone can tell you, okay, like I'll give you an example. So I'm doing this boot camp thing every morning now where I pay this guy to basically kick my butt uh, so I don't, you know, become corpulent again. And so today, like I I'm exhausted. Like it, it's, I'm just like, oh, like I got no sleep last night, totally exhausted. And I'm having to do these lunge squats and I hate doing these things. And, you know, the trainer comes over. He's like, what's wrong with you, man? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're doing these things totally wrong. And he's standing there. He's like literally like holding my arms and pulling, you know, and guiding me down. He's like, this is the distance you want to go to. He's like, you did these so good the other day. What's wrong with you now? Like that's the big difference. Like that's what happens is like even though I understand what the movement is and they've he's shown me the movement and I have, you know, I'm doing the movement on my own and it's different now. You know, it's the difference between book smarts and street smarts, between, uh, you know, having emotionally owned that thing that you're doing because you've done it so many times, you know, it, so it, it's not working for people because it doesn't just work. You have to go out and figure out what is your unique angle with this training. I can tell you how to become a New York Times bestseller, but most people in your audience and, and I literally, what are you going to do with that? Like, you, okay, you could, you have a, let's say you have a book. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to go out and do that stuff? No, it takes years of building up the, the base and the platform and that kind of stuff. So it's like, like the first time I ever made money uh, was on a Google AdWords pay per click campaign. I was literally, as an affiliate, selling two products how to stop sweating and how to lose man boobs. It was hilarious. <laughs> and I ended up, yeah, I know, I know. It was it was the funniest thing. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I literally just started scaling and scaling and scaling because there's patterns out there. And you have to first discover them for yourself. But there's very specific patterns. Like a good example would be, you know, uh, the psychology of how to write a good headline. Well, that psychology of how to write a good headline, let's say on a blog post or for like your podcast, that psychology is it the exact same psychology that you would use in a press release if you want to show up on in the in the news? It's the same psychology that if you want to like go and you know send an email to people, it, it it's the same thing. But you have to recognize the patterns in your own version of the business first. Is this all making sense? I just want to make sure. I'm it makes total sense to me, and I will summarize it for our listeners afterwards because I've been involved in this for sort of years and years and years, so I know exactly what you're saying. You're, you're basically creating somebody else's product and putting an extra shine on it so that they buy it from you. Uh, relatively, yeah. And you know, you have to learn the process. Like Facebook marketing, I spent you know tens of thousands of dollars over you know the uh, the course of a you know a, a year to learn how to do it really well. And you know, it's one of those things where I lost money at first. You know, it, it didn't work because I didn't really get it. And then all of a sudden, I got it, and I'm like, oh, I can make these campaigns profitable. You know, that's just how it is. Like you, it's like that with paid traffic. It's like that with a podcast. It's like that with everything. You know, that's just the nature of the beast. Because, because when I started on affiliate marketing, I had that same vision of sort of the Tim Ferriss four-hour work week, laying on automatic pilot, doing what I want, and I could never quite get it going. And my first logic on it was, right, I will sell products online that people are embarrassed about going to see someone. And I thought, right, hemorrhoids, I'm going to make piles of money. And that was my sort of like slightly humorous logic to it. And I would create... It is a burning problem. It is a burning problem, yeah. And I would try to sell hemorrhoid cream online. And because people are, you know, slightly embarrassed about doing it, they're just going to buy it secretly and it comes to me. And whatever angle I turned, it seemed to be that Google at the time was saying, no, that contravenes terms and conditions. This contravenes terms and conditions. And I just kept on getting to the point of going kind of almost... Just tell me what your terms and conditions are. And I would go, just check this 900 billion page document and you'll mm -hmm. find out. It just gave me no clues. So I kind of gave up on it and I thought, oh, it's never going to work. But so it's fascinating to hear you say that on a same kind of, almost the same kind of logic, the sweating and the man boobs, that you were very successful with it. Oh, I wouldn't say I was very successful. I made my first profits on that, but it was, 
you know, it was definitely something where I had to learn. Like I went through lots of keywords before it really worked. Also, I was doing that like 2000, end of 2005, 2006 kind of thing when Google AdWords was not like the Gestapo kind of thing that they are now. And it, what's funny is like I've even figured out like with Google AdWords how to like get around that. Like it's not hard. You just can't be in like an internet marketing, make money, business opportunity, lose weight. Like all the big things that like be everyone actually wants to know how to do, like lose weight and make money, don't sell that. You know, because that's it, – it'll kill you. But also the big thing is like now paid advertising really doesn't make – as much sense in a lot of the things like what you're doing makes perfect sense it's like here's a podcast here's content marketing let's build a relationship let's have what i call conversational conversion and you're going to save you'll save a ton of money you really will and and you get to have some fun with it like it's so it's cool so it's like people being people is better marketing than anything you could buy with money so so let's get to your your current position really of sort of audience hacker you you have come across methodologies to actually build an audience quicker for people who as you were saying wants to become a new york times bestseller people who want to market their podcast you have kind of cracked the code would that be right something like that yeah that's very deep, definitely very deep response <laughs> from you <laughs> yeah you it's know, a conversation yeah. johnny Absolutely. All right. I'll give you the rundown. So um, when I got married and had a kid, so I was, it was literally awesome seven figure business, but literally it was like a drunken howler monkey on a broken tilt to whirl. It was super crazy. And I had to look at that because I was, I was traveling all over the world, like sometimes speaking at conferences, sometimes, you know, doing whatever, but always hanging out in the bars, doing the hand kissing, baby shaking kind of stuff with everybody. And I was like, I can't travel as much because I need to be around for the wife and the kid. And so I just turned off my business because I was, you know, selling internet marketing products. I was like, I just don't like how this, how I'm portrayed. It was almost like, uh, you know, I was lampooning myself in a lot of ways. It's like, hey, here's how I made money. Woohoo. And it was fine. It was cool. It was fun. Uh, and it made lots of money. It was super nifty, but wasn't right anymore. And I didn't want my kid to be embarrassed by it when she grew up. You know, what does your dad do? Oh, he sells biz ops. Great. Um, so what happened was I, there was this sort of soul searching time and I was like, what do I want to get back to? What, you know, what do I want to do? We, you know, who am I? How do I want to show up in the world? And all of a sudden, and you were talking about this earlier, like it bubbled to the surface. It's like, why don't you get back into publishing? You've loved it since you were a but a wee ute. And I was like, all right, cool, let's do this. And so I had been quietly on the side. I had actually hired someone to do this for me, uh, but they had been publishing. I so I'd published 450 books into the Kindle ecosystem. I had not paid attention to any of it. And uh, my goal was obviously to make some money off of each book because Amazon is the biggest site on the planet that sells stuff. And I was like, right, hey, you know, here's all these people that want these books. I'll just give them these books. I had just books everywhere. And they were crappy. They were horrible. They were disgusting. Like, cause I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't paying attention. And so I was making like less than $120 a month off this whole thing. I'm like, this is just dumb. And so here it is, 2010. I'd been publishing for over two years at this point and barely made $2,000. Like it didn't even pay, it didn't even come close to even paying for the VA that I had doing the work. And so I was like, this is ridiculous. And one night, uh, my, uh, my father-in-law came over and playing with the kid and stuff like that. I'm like, Hey, you have a Kindle, right? Let me borrow it. So I get this dude's Kindle and I'm looking at this and all of a sudden it, like literally hit me in the face. I was like, Oh my God, I totally understand. I went, changed everything. And, uh, I had written this book called how to finally live debt free and wealthy. It was poorly written, but at least the, you know, the how to info was pretty good. Went and changed a couple of things on this book and literally within a couple of hours kind of relaunched it ended up outselling uh dave ramsey Su susie orman robert kiyosaki like i hit number one bestseller uh in personal finance and then relaunched it a couple months later ended up landing on the uh, it was the featured book for all of business and investing for the entire kindle store right let, so let me just, let me just slow you down there now i'm not going to ask you the secret ingredients because i'm sure that's something that you're going to hold back um but when you were looking at this kindle was it just your experience up to that point that came together when you looked at it and went i can totally see this or was it just something that was a total fluke that you could see 
Uh, no, it was it was I had I, I've trained myself. I'm what you would call now uh, an environmental deconstructionist when it comes to like business stuff. Like let me give you an example. Uh, I had not I have not paid attention to LinkedIn at all. Uh, I just did, never on my radar. You know, I had my fingers in other things. Two weeks ago, I decided I'd get pay attention to it. I'm now in the top five percent of all the profiles on LinkedIn. So. How how, it, how how do you do this though? How how do you deconstruct something? You know, for somebody like me, something like LinkedIn is just in front of me, and I just look at it, and I get occasional invites from people, and I will invite some people. So how do you look at something and deconstruct something that is there? Well, the basic way to do this is, and you don't need to get good at this. This is the kind of thing. Like, it, it's this is not a big deal. Like, I just happen to be, you know, like my, my one of my former partners called this, like, you know, your stupid human trick. Like, this is what I'll do is I'll look at something and be like, ooh, and I'll just geek out on it. It's, you know, so it's not like, you know, your listeners don't need to have this particular thing. Um, but for LinkedIn, for example, I just looked, I always ask the question, how do the eyeballs flow? You know, what what is moving the people? Where are they? How can you get to be uh, in, you know, influential in this environment? And the reality of LinkedIn is, if you're familiar with gamification, they have gamified this thing. They've turned it into a game. Like you can watch a progress bar of you improving your profile. You can watch a progress bar of you getting bigger in groups. And so the LinkedIn thing is the easiest thing on the planet because you're like, okay, where are people? Oh, they're in groups. What do you need to do to get seen? Oh, participate in groups. So this is like, you know, real rudimentary stuff. Like go forth, be interesting, talk to people. I literally just posted in a couple of groups. Uh, for example, there was one uh, LinkedIn Chicago, obviously is a local thing. And I, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna get out of my house. I'm gonna go <clears throat> meet some people. Let's go have fun with this. And so the week before the event that they were holding, I went and, uh, you know, jumped into the group and just started posting. I became within four days the top uh, influencer in the group of 93,000 people that was local to me. And so when I showed up at this event, a lot of people knew who I was because they'd been seeing my face in the group for the entire time. You know, so it's like that's how you do it is go there and don't don't poop in their pool like essentially like that's what was happening with kindle was people were teaching tactics that were essentially like mainlining human sewage into like a delicate ecosystem it was awful and so i changed that i was like okay instead of you know hurling tons and tons of crappy books that no one wants to read why don't we create one book that's helpful, that's beneficial, that's targeted toward a specific audience, and let's do it that way. You know, and so literally that changed everything. Was so, just so you're providing value. You're just finding the market and you're providing value to them. Shocking. But yeah, that's all there is to it. Like just go out there and be cool. And then like with the Kindle thing, it was all about getting into KDP Select, uh, which is the exclusive you know, you can enroll your books as you know, as long as you promise to be exclusive with Amazon. That gets you usually uh, preferred placement on Kindle devices. That was the big shocker because I've been staring at the bestseller lists uh, on the computer. There, it's a totally different experience on, a, on an actual device, you know, and that was the big shift. I'm like, wait a minute, these books, like the titles don't make sense. Like I don't get why this one's on top or why, they, and all of a sudden you see prime, prime, prime. And I was like, oh, that's what it is. So I put out like one of the first courses on how to do this and I did it in the Warrior Forum because uh, I had to, I literally had, I, I, I looked at it like a crusade because everybody in the warrior forum up until that moment had been teaching these courses that were literally destroying Kindle. It was horrible. And I'm like, guys, this is the biggest opportunity for people since almost the invention of the internet. And you have to stop abusing it. And so I published this course and it, I think, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but I just in gross sales that ended up as a WSO ended up doing like almost four hundred and fifty thousand dollars like in the first two months that i put it out like it was and i recorded it it, it was literally just me in my underwear sipping coffee my wife was bringing me sandwiches every couple of hours and i just made this course and just hurled it up there and it totally changed the entire 
Kindle publishing industry. And then after that, everybody kind of came out and they were starting, you know, obviously once you publish something, everyone's like, ooh, I can, you know, I'll, I'll do it my, my way of that. And so everybody kind of like based theirs off of my course. It was kind of cool to watch that happen. But I was the first guy to come out and say, hey, stop publishing crap. Focus on one book. Make it cool. Well, let's just take a pause on here because I, I want to play the speech which is the theme of the show and this is Steve Jobs um, amazing speech that he did in 2005 and I, I want to ask afterwards once we've heard his words whether you can actually join up the dots of your life whether you can see the path that has led you to that that almost um, realization that once again you can create your own environment and that's what I think we're talking about all the time is you making conscious decisions to to do something right do something which is good for the world and ultimately get the value back so uh, this is Steve Jobs of course it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college but it was very very clear looking backwards 10 years later again you can't connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Can you look at your life and connect your dots? Can you join up your dots? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, man, that's some truth right there. Yeah, that's, and it's interesting because I think, you know, going through the stuff I went through, even though, like, he's totally right. Like, I had no idea what I was doing at the time when I was 27 and I, like, moved out. I had no clue. I, I knew that I had to do something. But what that was, no idea. But, like, looking back, I can absolutely see that it's, like, you know, the, the, the stuff that I did, the steps that I took, the mistakes that I made have all kind of like turned me into, including the stuff I was talking about with the adoption. If it hadn't been for that, I might not, there, there's some things it's like that were really kind of rough where it's like, I kind of had to disengage emotionally. And part of my upbringing was learning how to do that. That's a defense mechanism I have. So it's like, if you want to look at like every single kind of thing that happened, I have literally gone through a gauntlet of stuff that is that I have become the kind of person who can handle you know from a business standpoint probably not physically but like literally being lit on fire you know and be very calmly serving people dinner while things are just going to heck all around me and it's okay because that's part of what you what, what I think you know a, a someone who who does this stuff needs to be you know it's a skill that you can develop but you only develop it by doing that but looking back absolutely you know, and, and I think would I can, you go through that journey again Johnny um it would be harder now with a wife and kid like I don't think I could make the same exact same choices but I think yeah I would probably do that again you know if it, like knowing what I know now that's what I like I, if I, I think I was talking to someone Jonathan Herbert uh, he's one of the co uh, co-owners of the internet marketing party in Austin Texas I was literally just on the phone with him uh, before I was talking to you and, and I was like, man, youth is wasted on the young. Like it really is because it's like you think about all that energy, that time, that freedom you have. And it just, ah, but if you sent me, like took my brain and sent it back to when I was like, you know, 15, first of all, I punched myself in the face. Uh, but after I was done with that, I'd have a, a very different life life trajectory. Well, we're going to do that now. We're actually going to send you back in time because this is the part of the show that we call the Sermon on the Mic. And this is when we play the theme tune. And while it's playing, you get transported by magic back in time to a room. And if you walked into that room and you saw the young Johnny Andrews, wonder what age you would choose. Would you choose the 15-year-old one and punch him in the face? Or would it be an older one? Would it be the 27-year-old? Well, I'm going to play the music. And when it slows down, you're up. This is the Sermon on the Mic. <laughs> The best bit of the show, the sermon on the mic, the sermon on the mic. Definitely 15. Absolutely. That's that key transitional phase right there where you're so young and you absolutely think you know everything. 
And so going back to that particular moment, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is like no person is an island and you need to seek the right kind of help. That's a big one is like, you know, beware advice. Everyone has advice. And so you want to look uh, to get advice from people who have been there, which is typically not going to be your circle of friends. You know, it's a, it's just very it's a it's a really interesting sort of environment because it's like when you're young, you're probably doing everything wrong, uh, which is fine. That's actually probably preferred, I think, you know, so it's like I don't think I'd want to go and ma- I, I would absolutely want to make mistakes. But the one thing that I would like to really, 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 really probably do over is to source information for better people than what I did. You know, if you want to be an entrepreneur, don't talk to academics. You know, if you want to, you know, if you want to do something successful, talk to people who are successful, find that stuff out, like seek guidance from the correct sources. That, that would really be uh, the biggest thing. What do you think you would say if you could go into the future as well? If, if you could meet a sort of a, a 40, a 44 year old Johnny same age as me if you could meet a 44 year old Johnny what do you reckon you would say to him I've never asked this question before oh interesting well, in that case you know what I don't know I'd probably I don't think I'd say anything to me I'd probably just shut up and listen because I find that uh, the longer I go in this the more I learn so it's like you know I'd be very curious to see if my hypotheses are correct uh, you know, uh, just in terms of personality, you know, I was uh, after the whole wife kid thing, I was a little bit like, oh, my God, I don't know who I am. And I ended up hiding behind people a lot. And so, you know, it's really been in the last year that I've sort of come back up to the front and that kind of thing. And I just want to, you know, I, I definitely look forward to see like how that has manifested itself, because the two truths I have learned and I definitely you know, would like to see the result of this. But these things just I have seen it just fundamentally true is you pick something like who are you and who do you serve? And then you pick something and you literally put one foot in front of the other consistently make small pivots, you know, when mistakes happen or like you find out that you're going slightly the wrong direction. But just keep it up because that's really what you know, that that's what everything comes down to. Just keep it up and you will be absolutely fine. And I want to see the result of that. Johnny, how can our audience connect with you, sir? Um, I'm a mystery. No, I'm kidding. Uh, you can go to uh, like my show, for example, Audience Hacker. I can find it in iTunes, which is awesome, or go to audiencehacker.com. And uh, I've actually got some really cool training if you want to check it out. It's uh, how we sold uh, one Kindle ebook sold over $30,000 in seven days. And so I literally break down the whole training course right there. And are you on Twitter and LinkedIn and all those? Oh, all that's the, yeah, I guess. Yeah, find me there too. Audience Hacker on Twitter or Audience Hacker on Facebook. Uh, and then LinkedIn is just Johnny Andrews. You can go and find me there. You'll, I, I look the same in all of my pictures. I found that helps. Well, it's been an absolute delight speaking to you tonight. And uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today, joining up the dots of your life. And Johnny, you have to come back again when you have more dots to join up because I found it fascinating talking to you and I love the passion that you show and I just love the kind of the kind of controlled madness really. It, it plays to my my passions. So I believe that by joining up those dots and connecting our past, it's the best way to build our futures. Johnny Andrews, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free, and we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.